first keynote speaker is uh, Vikas Chandra from uh, Facebook. He is the director of AI at uh, Facebook Reality Lab, and he will give his keynote on efficient audiovisual understanding on AI devices. Uh, please go ahead, Vikas. Yeah, thanks, Wei. Thanks for the introduction. Um, good morning. Um, and I just heard that uh, there are attendees from uh, 99 countries. So um, good afternoon and good evening as well to those of you who are in different parts of the world. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, I've been working in the area of tiny ML for a while now, uh, not only um, at Facebook, but even in my last job before, uh, before here when I was at ARM. Um, tiny ML has seen an explosive growth uh, in the last few years, and I'm really, really excited about its future where uh, it can take us because uh, the future of ML is tiny. Um, now, in, in this talk, um, I'm going to specifically talk about um, the challenges and opportunities in the area of video understanding for augmented reality. Uh, but before I do that, let's talk about uh, augmented reality. What exactly is AR? So what if we could augment uh, the world that we see around us? What exactly will this look like when we get there? What could we do with the technology? Um, now let, let's take a look at the glasses I'm wearing. Uh, this is not an AR glass, but assume it is. Um, now in the current uh, you know, uh, setting, um, I'm able to um, you know, see things better. They uh, improve the equity of my vision every waking moment. But what if there were AR glasses that enhance perception in other ways as well? Now, every few decades or so, uh, we reach an inflection point in how we interact with our devices. Um, let's take an example of laptops uh, or, or desktops, right, where we use keyboard and, and mice uh, to, to interact with the devices. Then came smartphones where uh, we basically touch and pinch and, and, and zoom and so on. And now we believe that uh, at some point in future, there's going to be an inflection point where the interaction with uh, our personal devices is going to be very, very different. It's been predicted um, that instead of carrying smartphones everywhere, we'll be wearing stylish glasses. Uh, these glasses will offer VR, AR, and everything in between. And we'll wear them all day and use them in almost every aspect of our lives. The distinction between AR and VR will vanish. The real and virtual worlds will just mix and match throughout the day according to our needs. So let's take some example of where it can help us uh, do interesting things. So imagine if you're walking uh, from somewhere late at night and it's dark outside, what if you could, with just a gesture, make it brighter? In you know, Other one is if you're um, going on a trip somewhere but your loved ones are not able to come with you. And this is, has been especially true in the last uh, one year uh, uh, with, with the pandemic. But what if you could spend some time with, uh, with the people that you want to spend time with virtually anywhere in the world? And what if we can actually see better for people uh, whose vision is, 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 not, is not great, um, for people like me? Um, so all of these are possibility, uh, but it doesn't have to stop there. What if AR can also help with memory and cognition? Imagine if you're in a business meeting where you can see the, the results that you wanna talk about right in front of your eyes. Or if you're traveling, uh, where you can um, basically have the translation right, uh, right in front of your eyes. And the last one, which I really like, is basically the ability for you to uh, recall somebody's name uh, if you have met them before. And, and this, um, I, I believe, is one of the key features that I think uh, AR can enable. But we don't want the technology to be dumb. We don't want it to just pop everyone's name all the time in front of your eyes, because that's uh, not really how you know, human brains work, right? What we really want is, um, is to be context aware. We just want to pop things to pop up when we need it. It's the same way with our own, uh, is the same, that's the same way our own memory works and it will take always on contextually aware AI to make that happen. You can think of AR as a tiny assistant with a perfect memory and an internet connection sitting on your shoulder, answering your questions and feeding you useful information all the time. That's our vision of what AR will look like. Now, let's take an example, uh, a very simple example that we discussed with, um, you know, putting a, a name to a face. What does it take to get there? 
<clears throat> so to begin with, we need a high resolution display that's bright enough to be visible in the daylight. It needs contextual awareness to figure out who is the person of interest. It can also be uh, based on eye tracking where it figures out who you are looking at uh, to understand uh, where uh, the annotation needs to go. Uh, image recognition will need to happen to associate an individual with an image. Uh, you need graphics to render the image. And there's a whole lot of technology that will happen or that needs to happen. Um, you need world locking to attach the annotation to the person uh, because if the person moves or if you move, you want the annotation to move with them. You need uh, depth sensing because if, if they move around, uh, and, and things get occluded or they go behind uh, another person, you want the annotation to go behind with them as well. So what I'm trying to say is that even for a simple use case, um, a whole lot of technologies have to come together. Many of them exist, and many of them do not exist. Uh, many of them exist in a different form factor and they may have lots of compute and, and power requirement that becomes challenging in a form factor devices like augmented reality glasses. So to deliver the best user experience, uh, we have to deeply understand user context. And that is an interesting research area. So let's take a look at um, what would be um, uh, a typical characteristic of an AR glass, right? It has to be socially acceptable. Uh, so it has to look like, you know, sort of the glasses that I'm wearing. It has to be lightweight because you're wearing all day. Um, it has to sustain all day usage. Um, so you don't want to be charging your glasses multiple times a day. Um, and because it's sitting next to your face, uh, you have to be very cognizant of uh, how hot does it get? Uh, because our phones do get hot occasionally if you use them quite often. So it is thermally constrained. And, and these are all the technologies that I talked about uh, in the last slide. Um, you know, we need to figure out the optics and display, audio for things like superhuman hearing, uh, computer vision and so on and so forth. But one thing is very clear uh, for those of you who do work in this area that uh, AI is going to play um, a really critical role uh, for all of them. Now, now that we have uh, made it clear that AI uh, plays a critical role, the question is why on device AI? Why do we need to run these models uh, locally on the, on, on the glasses itself? Uh, and there are a few reasons. Um, the first and foremost is privacy. Um, so because these glasses are going to be there all the time looking at the world the way we look at, we need to make sure that the data that they have uh, stays on the device with the users and not shared um, in, in, uh, with, with, a, with a computer that's outside of your home. The second was latency. So we do want uh, the devices to react uh, very quickly. Uh, imagine a situation where your, your child uh, is, is laughing or playing with their favorite doll or, or whatever. And in that case, you want the, the devices to react very quickly uh, in capturing that moment. So every millisecond of latency matters. Uh, the third one is connectivity. Uh, so in the Western world, we do assume that we have uh, connect, internet connection everywhere, uh, but that's not true in many parts of the world. Also, if you are going to go on a hike um, somewhere in a park where uh, internet may not be there, you still want the devices to work. And the last bit is energy. So th this is interesting because a uh, lot of people, a lot of time people don't realize that it does take uh, a lot of energy to also transfer data, sometimes orders of magnitude more. Uh, wireless is not cheap. Uh, so in that case, it may make sense for us to do uh, competition on device instead of sending data on the cloud. So these are all the reasons why we're really investing in making sure that whatever computational needs uh, these glasses have, we can do them on device. But AR applications are not homogeneous, right? They, they come in all shapes and sizes. And here is an example uh, or a laundry list of applications that, um, that basically show different characteristics, right? Um, so let's take an example of speech or language or text-to-speech uh, text or language understanding. Um, and I know arbitrarily I put together this, this four, uh, you know, axes that uh, identify what the characteristics are. So they are memory bandwidth, latency, usage frequency, and computational intensity, right? So as I go through different use cases, uh, for example, video understanding, eye tracking, hand tracking, keyword spotting, what I'm trying to highlight is that different applications look very different. They are not the same, both in terms of requirement of compute, memory bandwidth, latency, and so on. 
And that makes it very um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, interesting research problem in how do we enable these use cases, which look so different um, on a piece of hardware? What, what does it take to get there? So there are different uh, challenges uh, in, in making that happen. Uh, from the application side, uh, we need to support heterogeneous applications, uh, as I just described in the last slide. Um, there should not be any user perceivable latency, and that's key because of the kind of use cases that we really want to see from these glasses. And it has to support high resolution data because uh, there will be you know, cameras uh, capturing data at high frame rate, high resolution. We need to process them uh, really quickly and efficiently. Now, from the system side, there, uh, there needs to be a lot more um, you know, efficiency that we need to have from these devices that doesn't exist right now. So we need to get like at least an order or two of, of improvement from where we are right now. The system also has limited compute and storage resources that we need to figure out how to get, a, um, you know, get around. Um, and also there are limited, share, limited and shared bandwidth to system memory. Uh, and that's more of a hardware concern. And I'll talk about that as well, uh, how we uh, alleviate that. Um, so you know, as the title of the talk was uh, audiovisual understanding, that's uh, one particular use case that, uh, that we are looking at is video understanding. Um, trying to understand the user activity and environment, what's happening around you. Um, let's take an example in the picture that's shown here. Um, if if your dog is playing with a ball and and you take and you basically say that hey take picture of my dog playing with ball, uh, you want the system to understand that it's your dog um, and and not a dog, right? Um, so it has to be personalized, proactive, and it has to be context aware. What if you don't have to tell it to take the picture and it understands that something interesting is happening and I should capture that? What does it take? Uh, what does it take to get there? The first one is um, data, right? Um, you know, you, you can have uh, really sophisticated AI models, but if it's not trained well on real life and realistic data, then it will fail. So how do we train, um, you know, these models with limited label data that we have? And there are, you know, multiple approaches. Uh, I'll talk about them. Uh, data augmentation is one, self-supervised learning is another one. The second one is multimodal AI. Uh, so instead of having just one mode of uh, trigger, um, for example, camera, which could be expensive. What if you have a uh, cascaded inference? Um, so uh, you can have cheaper modality to trigger the inputs. It could be audio, it could be something else like you know, IMU. Um, and, and once that triggers, you can have uh, expensive modality to capture what you need to capture. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, once multiple things trigger, then you can combine the inputs from all of those sources to get a higher accuracy of understanding. And the last one is more from system perspective. How do we get more uh, power efficiency where these models will run? Um, and again, uh, there uh, we look at uh, efficient compilation of multi-stream models. So if you have multiple modality, as I talked about in the second bullet, how do we run them together uh, at the same time? Uh, because uh, you know the hardware may look different, uh, an audio stream versus a video stream have different compute requirements. Uh, and then we also look at hardware aware model design. And I'll talk about code design uh, a little bit more uh, later in the talk. So what exactly is video understanding? Um, there are two ways to define it. One is at a course level, we can understand what's happening um, in, in the environment, right? So on the left side, you can see uh, getting a haircut or playing guitar or playing basketball or surfing. Um, I mean, these are uh, very high level course level, you know, description of what's happening around you. Uh, but you can also localize action. Um, you know, uh, this person is, you know, sitting down or looking at a book or walking or, 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 or doing something else. And you can have multiple localized action in a given video frame. And, and those are both interesting because uh, depending on the needs, you can you can react very differently once you understand what else is happening uh, in the scene. So I talked about the challenges of data. Um, so one of the model that we use in video understanding is slow fast model, uh, and uh, you know you can train you can train the model with, uh, with with data that you have. But a common technique is to augment the data by making changes to your data set. Uh, now, for image-based augmentation, one of the technique is called grid mask, where you put 
um, you take out uh, essentially parts of your images, like as shown in the in the second figure, uh, and you train the model with those augmented um, uh, data set. And the rationale is that you know the the model regularizes better if it doesn't see certain part. And you know for different uh, images, you'll do different sort of grid mask. Now we can do that here as well, uh, but we have more information because it's video. Uh, because it's video, we do understand what the subject is, uh, and, and we can basically do sort of a saliency detection, which could be motion-based. So in this case, for example, your video can understand that uh, the subject of your video is chicken. And because the chicken moves more than the background, uh, when you do grid mask, you can leave the subject as is, and you can put the grid mask around it. Uh, and what that does is basically it makes the model uh, even um, you know uh, more smarter by a, by learning the characteristic of the chicken more than the background, and this is one approach that we have used and and we have seen a good result in terms of what the accuracy of the model looked like uh, with this approach. The second approach is uh, to alleviate the data issue is self supervised training. So even with uh, we do a lot of data augmentation, we are still limited by label data. Now in the real world, we have you know really huge amount of unlabeled data. Uh, so how do we tap into that? So SSL or self-supervised learning is a common technique that's used, and there are different ways to use it. Uh, so the whole idea of self-supervised training is that you provide a data set without label, and you expect the model to understand the key idea in, in, in the data that you provide. So it needs to understand the semantic and, and extract information through that. So one example is contrastive loss. So if you provide um, similar representation uh, for the same object uh, through different views, uh, and if you keep providing it and you tell it that they are similar, it will try to understand that what makes them similar. And the same thing for uh, different representation of different objects. Other approach is uh, spatial tasks. So if you have um, a, a lot of video frames, uh, you can break the frames into tiles and you can rearrange them. And then the task is for the model to rearrange it back into how it was. And in doing that, it can learn a lot, lot of uh, information, uh, latent information about, uh, about the data. The third one is temporal, where you do the same thing, but in time, where you can jumble up the, the frames in time and expect the model to put it back in the right order. So these are all the techniques where um, you know you can make the model much richer, uh, even when you have limited data, uh, label data. Uh, as shown in the table here, I mean the the definitely it does help. As you can see, uh, you know the accuracy of video classification with all of these techniques put together uh, went up significantly high. Now let's talk about deployment challenge. Um, so we have the data, we have trained the model, and we are happy with it. How do we run them? Um, you know, a typical cost of running a camera runs into hundreds of milliwatts. It's, it's not cheap. And especially on a battery constant devices like AR glasses, uh, these things can become a uh, huge uh, overhead. Um, it also has transmission costs. So every time you take a picture, um, it's high resolution. You have to transfer uh, to an SOC that can uh, understand um, or run these models. Also on the inference cost side, the video models are expensive. Um, it can typically take uh, hundreds of gigaflops to understand uh, the user environment and action. So how do we get around that? So one approach is uh, what is defined as a cascaded approach. Um, so what if we use a cheaper modality as trigger, say audio or IMU? Um, and when something interesting happens, then we can figure out um, what's happening around you from the vision perspective. Uh, just as an example, uh, an audio capture is orders of magnitude cheaper. So we can go from hundreds of gigaflops to tens of megaflops. Uh, it's a huge improvement. Um, and also the, the transmission cost is cheaper because we could typically um, uh, uh, have you know, th these um, models run uh, very close to sensors as well. Um, so there are different approaches uh, in, in doing that. And let's talk about one. So. Uh, Assume that you are traveling um, uh, or you're going to, uh, you're walking around the city uh, and uh, you know, your microphone is receiving inputs on, on, the, on the things around you. Um, and you can detect transitions in your environment or action that's happening around you. And these typically are you know, cheaper sort of inputs in tens of kilobytes. The models are not that big. Uh, it could be in tens of megaflops. 
Um, and, and this model detects something interesting is happening. Um, and, and when it detects that, uh, it can enable or it can trigger the camera to come on. And this model is typically bigger. Um, the inputs are also larger. Let's say you go into hundreds of megaflops and it, it detects that uh, there's potentially a basketball that's happening. Now, once that happens, um, then you can uh, essentially start to go into full action where you start taking multiple frames on the camera and you also combine that with the audio input. So this is where you actually have um, multimodal AI in multimodal input to your AI model. And this model could be huge, right? Because now your inputs are in, in tens of megabytes because you have multiple frames coming in. You also have the models which are much, much larger. It could be in tens of gigaflops and you can have a lot more fine grain action, right? So now you can, you can detect whether it's somebody is dribbling or dunking or blocking um, and then the system can react and, and do whatever is necessary to um, for this particular scene. So this is an example uh, I just want to show where you know you can take advantage of you know multiple modality of input in a cascaded way, and this is uh, this could be one approach to solve the the problem of battery drain if the camera is on all the time. So this uh, is an example from this work uh, which happened at Facebook on uh, slow fast network, and as you can see. Um, to, to predict what's happening, uh, you can have multiple modes of input. So you could have um, you know, an audio signal with a very high sampling rate. Uh, you could have video uh, with high frame rate. You could have low frame rate video as well. And then it starts to become uh, interesting problems of um, you know, how do you combine them? How do you uh, do a deep fusion to learn better features from this sort of model? <clears throat> Okay, so we talked about um, you know um, deployment. Uh, we, we talked about the model. Let's talk about uh, where hardware can play a role. So very um, you know a cartoonish picture of how an SOC looks like is shown here in in this slide, where you have you know application memory, system memory. You have different IP, um, and let's say if you have a monolithic um, in an accelerator that's sitting on the system bus, and that's one way to do it. Um, a better way to do that is, um, you know, folding uh, the accelerators inside the IP. And the reason is simple. Uh, if you recall the slide that I show about the heterogeneity of application in, in, in the beginning, it just says that, um, you know, a speech uh, use cases are very different than vision use cases. Um, and having a monolithic accelerator that deals with both is not very efficient. So the approach uh, which is better is to fold the accelerator inside different IP and build them uh, exactly the way you want them to be for that particular use cases. Now, this gives you two benefits. Uh, one that I talked about of the, um, you, know, uh, you know, tuning the accelerator to your needs. The second one is it also saves the transmission uh, of data back and forth in the system bus to the accelerator. And uh, doing it this way, it doesn't have any contention. Um, you know, they're designed for the particular use case and the data is local. And that helps uh, quite a bit on, on the power as well. So to build uh, efficient hardware for AR, there are a few things that uh, we can do um, because the applications are very heterogeneous. It does require uh, one to think about building heterogeneous accelerators, not just one monolithic accelerator, and they can be deeply embedded um, in, in, in where they need to be. Um, you know, to, to alleviate the problem of latency, um, one can have small batch side um, uh, or very stream friendly processing. And then, um, you know, the data flow becomes very interesting uh, when you talk about high resolution data. Uh, and there are lots of approaches of, of doing that um, using tiling and, and scheduling. And that's where uh, the compiler and accelerator architecture together comes into picture. Now, from the system side, uh, we still have this requirement I talked about um, that we need to have two orders of magnitude uh, improvement in efficiency. Um, we need to figure out how do we deal with compute and storage issue and, and also the shared bandwidth that I talked about. And the only way to solve that is through hardware software co-design. And I'll briefly touch upon that in the next few slides. So let's take an example of um, uh, a neural net uh, where you have, uh, let's say for image classification, you have a neural net model. Um, and then on the, on, on the right side, you have an, an accelerator that, uh, that can execute it. 
Now, if these two things are uh, designed independent of each other, uh, there's a loss of efficiency, right? Because you are not uh, taking full advantage of each other. Uh, and the metrics that you can optimize for could be, you know, you need high accuracy, you need low latency and, and so on. The key insight here is that if you are able to optimize um, the in an accelerator hardware, understanding what's going to be running on it, uh, that will give you a lot more efficiency, but it doesn't need to flow only in one direction, right? The bottom arrow shows that once you have um, a particular way of running something in hardware very efficiently, you should be able to take that knowledge and apply that in, in designing a better model. So, you know, if you look at the typical approaches of NAS or network architecture search, um, people search for, uh, you know, either lower flops or, or, or a metric like that, but it doesn't uh, preclude us from using a hardware aware search scheme in your NAS as well, right? So this whole idea of code design where we learn from the model characteristic in building the accelerator, and then we learn from what really works well in hardware um, and then fold that back into the model is an approach that um, shows lots of benefits. And I'll have some data as well in the next few slides to show that. So to optimize and customize a neural network uh, for a target hardware, um, neural architecture search has been widely studied. Uh, the typical conventional NAS methods uh, leverage um, evolutionary algorithm or reinforcement learning, but they can be prohibitively expensive as thousands of models are required to train to search for a single network. We instead focus on one-shot architecture search methods because of its superior search efficiency and accuracy. Specifically, we propose two framework focusing on searching the network layer hyperparameters and network topology. So the first framework we propose is Attentive NAS. And this is the, some work uh, which we recently um, uh, submitted to uh, CVPR and, and it's been accepted. Uh, so Attentive NAS focuses on searching the network layer hyperparameters, including number of layers, kernel size, and number of channels, et cetera. And by improving the sampling method used in one-shot architecture search method, Attentive NAS outperforms all the existing methods on the ImageNet data set. The second uh, approach on NAS we have is called Scale NAS, uh, which focuses on searching the best network topology. So for example, the visual understanding task like pose estimation or semantic, uh, semantic segmentation um, scale variant representations are important because your different features could be of different scale. And that usually is a challenge in most models. So we search for the best network topology to enable multi-scale feature fusion. Um, so this particular work has been really interesting. As you can see from the slides uh, or the graphs on the right, um, that the, the, the quality of these models using this sort of NAS approaches is really great. <clears throat> Uh, since I'm talking about NAS and hardware software co-design, this is the approach that we take. So you have a NAS which basically feeds off uh, some sort of a profiler which gives you an indication of how the model does on, on the hardware. And this could be latency, this could be power, or this could be combination of both. And that feedback uh, basically goes to the NAS uh, and it uh, looks at building different components of the NAS uh, and, and ultimately profiling that through training of what that model does in terms of accuracy. And together, essentially, this loop continues until you get where you need to be. Uh, as, a, as an example on the right side, uh, you know, in many cases, you can have you know, a, a, a good accuracy gain on this, at the same latency, or you can keep the same accuracy, but you can have a, a significant latency saving. Um, and we have been using this approach for a lot of models that we are building inside FRL. Now, I didn't talk about compiler support so far, right? Because um, you know this is also an important factor uh, in multiple pathway architecture. So take an example of the video audio visual understanding I talked about earlier, where you have uh, multimodal inputs, you have audio stream coming in, you have video stream coming in, um, and, and they all look very different. So you have to have support for uh, efficient network architecture, things like you know, depth-wise, group convolutions, attention layer, and so on. Now, in terms of compilation, um, you, know, you can do a lot of different uh, key innovations there. Uh, one is you minimize activation spilling. So activation spilling is a concept which means that if your activations that are generated in, in between the layers, they exceed the amount of you know, activation memory that, that you have, then it has to go to DRAM. And, and sending data and fetching data back from DRAM is very expensive. Um, so we need to uh, do that uh, to remove uh, DRAM accesses. 
Um, and then uh, it will also improve uh, your latency uh, uh, bottleneck uh, uh, by improving the memory access. So compiler is a key part of what we are building. And uh, usually what we have seen is uh, we, you just can't build an accelerator and then have a compiler um, as an afterthought. It has to be done together. In many cases, we have to start building the, the compiler framework much before that, much before the, the architecture is frozen in stone. So that uh, brings me uh, to my last slide. Uh, I talked about lots of different concepts. I talked about hardware software code design, uh, where we can improve system efficiency and so on. But there are a lot of future directions that are also interesting that um, I'm hoping the research community um, spend some time thinking about that. Um, one is network hardware co-optimization. Uh, is it possible to build an ML framework uh, that can actually design the hardware and the network topology at the same time, right? So I talked about this whole uh, multiple arrows approach of going back and forth, but imagine instead of doing that, uh, if we can have uh, an algorithm where both of them are sort of becoming, become the loss function where they get optimized um, together. And I have seen some work um, and, and they look promising, but a lot more work has to go there. In sensor and near sensor computing are especially important uh, for these use cases because in many cases, um, you can capture images from your sensor, and if you look at them and nothing interesting is happening, then you have just wasted uh, quite a bit of power uh, because you know it wasn't really that important. What if we could build a model that can run uh, in sensor or near sensor that detects if something interesting is happening, and if it's not, then you don't even send the data. So reducing the cost of data movement is really key. And I've seen some really interesting work happening in that particular domain as well. And the last one is uh, lifelong online learning. Uh, we need uh, these models that are running on the glasses to become very personalized. They need to understand uh, you know, each user and, and their particular nuances of how they use the devices. So having a capability to learn on device, it's, it's really important. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a lot of approaches of doing that. And we have been looking at some, but this is an area as well where we expect a lot more to come out of academia in the coming years. So with that, uh, that brings to the end of uh, my talk. I think we have done well in, in virtual reality. Uh, we have started to scratch the surface of what AR can bring. Uh, it's a long way to go, but we are very excited about the future and uh, I'm looking forward to working closer with uh, lots of people in this community, both industrial partners and, and research labs. Thank you. All right, thanks, Vikas, for that great presentation. Uh, we have a few questions, so let me go through them. So the first question uh, is, can attentive mass and scale mass be fine-tuned to any hardware, or is it very specific to your own hardware? No, they can be fine-tuned to uh, any hardware. Uh, you have to understand that in the graph that I showed about, uh, talked about here, uh, there is a hardware profiler. Now this profiler predicts what the hardware will do given a particular model. So as long as you put in the right uh, sort of uh, understanding of the hardware that you have, the model that uh, evolves using NAS can, can be tuned to that. So it's it's agnostic of the hardware. It has to be modeled rightly in your framework though. Mm -hmm. All right, makes sense. Can you elaborate on the on-device learning uh, approach? Yeah, so uh, we have just started in this. So, and I know the other academic research mm -hmm. that have uh, done a lot of work on that. Uh, again, there are approaches of you know uh, you know federated learning, or there are approaches where uh, you can uh, have differential privacy based learning. And there's a lot of uh, uh, you know a lot more innovations happening in the last few years on that. Uh, so. Um, this is an area that's in active research internally, so I can't talk a lot about it, but I mean, I know that even in um, academic research, um, there's a lot of innovation that's going on in there. Right. I, I, I understand you can't talk about specifically what you guys are doing, but can you give some uh, high level view of what do you view as the, the eventual goal of on-device learning? So the eventual goal of on-device learning to me is um, having specific things that uh, a particular user does. So for example, when we talk about voice triggers, when we talk about different ways I want to communicate with my devices, uh, you know, there could be very specific things that you know, we can give the capability for the users to train their models just with 
you know, the specific nuances that they have, right? And that that particular learning doesn't need to go and affect a global model that goes to all the users. So these are the use cases where I think, um, you know, on-device learning might be very interesting where, because of personalization uh, context. Right, right. That makes sense. Uh, can you give some examples? This is another question. Can you give some examples of how the compiler can be uh, can constrain the hardware specifically? Yeah, so um, one of the thing you know with compiler is uh, if you think on a meta level, right? What does a compiler do? It takes your graph and it figures out how to schedule um, you know different operations on the hardware. Now. Um, if you look at NAS, where you're looking at network topology, um, and if you find that using NAS, as I've shown in this figure, and then you essentially say, okay, now that I have this uh, model, let's figure out how do I compile that to the hardware. That's the current way of doing it. Everybody does it like that. But one potential approach is uh, folding the compiler into the NAS itself, right? Because uh, there is scheduling and tiling and all of these things that you can do with the hardware that has an implication of how you design the model. So initially, maybe you are worried about a large activation footprint because uh, you know your your data will spill, as I talked about earlier. Uh, but if you can tile your uh, your, your your layers, uh, that may alleviate the problem. So folding that compiler um, sort of inside the NAS flow uh, gives you a lot more flexibility on what you optimize for, and it's sort of a joint optimization as well uh, that we have been exploring. Okay, so you. Envision that uh, this is mostly static ahead of time compilers for AR VR systems, or is it uh, wrong time scheduling? No, so this is ahead of time, right? Because you know the graph okay. exactly what you're looking at, so you can do ahead of time compiling. Right, right, okay. All right, uh, next question is from Kurt. So you know this is going to be a tough question. Uh, <laughs> relating to the attentive mass. Uh, your archive paper principally focused on computer vision work note. Have you applied attentive mass to speech recognition and uh, NLP? Uh, if um, so or not, how much change do you uh, expect will be required? Right. So yeah, it is correct that we applied the, the supernet based approach for computer vision task where we figure out how to efficiently uh, sample uh, the Pareto of these models, and that gives us, uh, you know, quite a bit of improvement. Um, so yes, we are uh, applying it to other use cases as well. Um, we don't have any results to share, but hopefully um, we can publish uh, something soon uh, this year. Um, yeah, that's all I can say. But I mean, the earlier early results that we see out of this work for uh, speech and NLP model is definitely promising uh, because, in theory, you know, it this approach doesn't preclude any other you know uh, uh, use cases to be a part of it right computer vision is something that is easier because there's a whole lot of data set and, and understanding of how to use it and that's why we went after that uh, but we have been applying to speech and nlp models absolutely okay okay that's great okay so um, i guess i'll ask the last question which is a little bit more of a high level from a product perspective now for ar glasses you know, power consumption is going to be very key because of you know, mm -hmm. thermal constraints and, and the battery considerations. So do you have a sense of uh, at what point in terms of the energy per inference would be required in order to make AI glasses a reality? Yeah, and it, it, then it becomes uh, more of a, uh, a product question of, you know, because you can always enable a fewer things if, if uh, your, your battery becomes important. Now that will make um, you know, the product uh, lose some of the features and that may or may not be good. Uh, so from, from that perspective, there is always that knob. Now, uh, we don't want to go that, go, go that way because we want to have more and more features as much as we can to make these glasses really, uh, uh, you know, in interesting for the users to, to use them. Uh, and that's why the work that we have been doing is to make sure that where can we get more and more efficiency out of the system. Uh, but in the short term, if if it still doesn't fly, because a lot of the work is in flight in terms of model architecture, in terms of building the right hardware, um, then we have to really see uh, what features does need to exist on these glasses. So you know, this is you know the first inning of um, AR, uh, if 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 I may. Uh, this is going to take a while. Uh, it's going to take a community to build uh, where we need to be, 
Um, if you look at smartphone, like, you know, the smartphone from 2005 looks very different than the smartphone that we have in our palm right now. And it took uh, a, a large and long amount of time to get to where we are right now with all of the applications and how seamlessly things run. And so you'll see that evolution with, uh, with these devices as well. Uh, but we need to start investing in making sure that there is a path to, to get there. Right. So much more to come. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Vikas. That was a great presentation. Uh, again, just a quick uh, shout out to our sponsors. Bear with me for one minute. We have different categories. We have executive sponsors. First one being ARM. Then we have Qualcomm. We have Samsung. Platinum sponsors. Ada Compute, Lattice Semiconductor, Gold Sponsors, Brainchip, Babel Labs, DSP Group, Edge Impulse, Emza, Gray Matter Labs, Green Waves, Hymax, Imagimob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, Quixo, Reality AI, Sensi ML, Silicon Labs, Sentient, Google TensorFlow, Xmos, and lastly, silver sponsors, Edge Cortex, Hachi, and Synsense.